one day a charge was given to a soldier in a land so far from home to climb that hill when death was surely waiting determined he decided to press on in his mind he pictured people living in freedom all because of the price that he would pay his own life a sacrifice by his own choosing but oh what a victory that day he took the hill a perfect soldier he took the hill now the battle's over the price was paid Field for souls, a charge was given to a soldier in a land so far from home. Calvary's climb and death was surely waiting. Determined, he decided to press on. Oh, in his mind, he pictured people living in heaven, all because of the price that he would pay. His own life, a sacrifice by his own choosing, but oh, Well, thank you, David, our own military recruiter here. And uh, what a wonderful voice and wonderful song. Open your Bible with me today, please, to the book of John, chapter number 15. John 15. And uh, this verse has already been flashed on the screen in one of the videos because it is absolutely the perfect text, I think, for a day like today. And the subject that David just sung about and the one with which I like, would like to address you here for a few moments today. John chapter 15 and verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, said our Lord Jesus, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. The greatest form of love is sacrifice. There is no greater love than that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Gratitude, as I said earlier, I think is becoming a forgotten 
trait in so many, in too many areas today in our national life. How do you express gratitude for what tens of thousands, millions of, of veterans have done? I often preach funerals and the burial is at the National Cemetery because the person, the deceased was a veteran. And I've watched them in the flag folding ceremony over and over and over, I guess hundreds of times. And they fold the flag and then whoever's officiating there in charge, they hand that triangular folded flag to the widow or to the family, to the closest relative. And they always say words like this, a grateful nation wants to give you this token of our appreciation for the service of your loved one or words to that effect. I often think though, when they make that little statement at the end, has anybody said thank you to the deceased before today? And we went through a period of time in America, especially after Vietnam, when patriotism was really out and when our troops came home from Vietnam, they were treated, they were treated woefully. It was sad to see what happened in the news accounts in those days. I'm glad that there's more and more a group of people who say we owe everything to these veterans in terms of American life and we can't overdo it and we can't say it too often and we should not wait until we fold the flag to say it, amen? So today in this service, this is, I've said, is an annual service to recognize and thank all of you who came up here and stood and your families who didn't come to thank you for your sacrifice. I looked up the word sacrifice in the dictionary and the technical definition of sacrifice is the act of giving up something valued for something regarded as more important or worthy. Let me read that again. Think, give me your, your thoughts now for a few moments. Sacrifice is the act of giving up something that you value for something that you regard as more important or worthy than your own objectives. And so veterans today, we appreciate your sacrifice. You gave up something that was valued to you, your life and your family here in the country and you gave it up for something more important and that's the greater cause of liberty. And so you left your home and your family. You left your friends. You joined the Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, whatever it may have been. You went into basic training, a very rigorous time of training and then in most cases you went on to more advanced training of some type. And then after you were trained, many of you served in combat in harm's way is more than just a little phrase to you. You stood there and you heard, the, you heard the bombs fall and you heard the bullets, you heard the artillery going over your head. You heard the cries of the injured. You really were willing and vulnerable to death for your own self. And then you were, many of you were wounded Many of you live today with pain in your body. Some of you have shrapnel that you're carrying around that you've carried now for 10, 20, 30 years. A foreign object that brings you pain every single day that you arise. Some of, some, many, in fact, across the years have paid the ultimate sacrifice. And many have died. They've given their life for their country. And no matter where you are, that should touch your heart on this Memorial Day. I go out to our own national cemetery here in Florence, and I look at all those graves, those crosses and stars of David lined up, going out clear to the top of the hill there out of sight. And tens of thousands of them have now been buried here in our own community. If you've never been, you could go tomorrow. I think the ceremony's at 11 o'clock. I'm not sure exactly. I think it's in our program even. It's a very, very moving thing to go out there in the city of death and see all those crosses of all the people that served. A few years ago, I was in the Philippines preaching 
and I was in Manila, and they took me to the National Cemetery there. I understand they brought the bodies of all those men and women who died in World War II to that great, great cemetery. As far as you could see to the horizon, those white crosses in a perfect line. And I thought of all the men and women that gave their life for the country in World War II. I thought of them in their youth, in their 20s, and many of them in their teens that never enjoyed their life. They sacrificed. And then I read in the paper just recently, 20 suicides a day by those who have served and come home because they're not only, many gave their life, others were wounded in their body, but many are wounded in their soul. And this post-traumatic stress disorder and depression grips their lives and controls them in many cases, and many of them are dying by their own hand. Oh, we can't overdo it in saying thank you and we appreciate what you've done for our country to our veterans today. Last week as I was talking about this service, after our service, the wife of one of our veterans came up to me and she said, I'm so glad that you're going to preach for a few moments and talk to the men. Some of these men are carrying such guilt. She said, I know of how some of them in combat, there was collateral damage and innocent people were killed and some of these men live with that every single day of their lives. And I'm glad to hear that you're going to talk to them and share the gospel with them. I think of one story that I'd like to tell you today that I think illustrates it. My father-in-law was named Albert Phelps. Mr. Phelps was um, just a very, very young man in 1941 when World War II broke out. And uh, Mr. Phelps grew up in East Texas and in the Fort Worth, Dallas area. He joined the Army in 1941. And he went to his basic training there nearby Fort Worth. And then he went up to Massachusetts for some advanced training. Meanwhile, his wife gave birth to a little boy. And so after his training in Massachusetts, he rode the train <clears throat> all the way back to Fort Worth. It took him several days to get there in those days just to see his newborn son for the only time he would see him for several years. And then he shipped out. He went to... They sent him to Africa where Rommel, the German general, was fighting with uh, the Allies. And he fought there in the army against Rommel in, or, uh, let's see, the name of the place was Oran, or Oran, Algeria in North Africa. And then the battle moved up into Europe and so he went up to Salerno in Italy. It was the very south perimeter, the edge of the... the uh, uh, Normandy and D, the D-Day invasion. And so there he served. He was an entry, infantryman. He was just a private in the army, but he served there in what was called Bloody Salerno, one of the bloody battles of the war. And he wouldn't talk about it for many, many years after I married his daughter. But then he began to talk about it, and sometimes he would come and stay here and visit with us and he would want to talk with me sometimes about his wartime experiences. He told me about how that at Salerno, that there were great cliffs, and the only way they could get up on the top of the hill to fight was ropes, and they had to propel themselves up the side of it. And it was so st steep that the Nazis at the top would push off big boulders and rocks that they had piled up and they would hit the men. Sometimes they killed the men. Sometimes they knocked them off their ropes, and they would die from the fall. And he described how, how many men were lost just trying to get to the top of the hill. He told me, he said, you know, your helmet is about your most important thing after your weapon. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it protects your head. But he said, do you know, for months at a time, I cooked in my helmet, and I heated water. And I shaved, and I would warm up water and even take a bath, a sponge bath, as they called it, out of his helmet. And he, he, he told me all about the helmet. I never would have thought of that, of course. And then he told me, he said, I watched my, my cousin get hit with a direct hit, an artillery shell or something came in. 
and it blew him up. And I looked up in the tree, and there's part of his body hanging in the tree. Sacrifice, you see. And I knew him all those years. Married his daughter, was a part of the family. He never said anything about it until the last seven or eight years before he died. He was injured. He carried shrapnel on his body. He had a purple heart and several other medals, and I don't know what they are. He was in the first wave of returnees when, they, when the war was over because they told him, uh, you've served <clears throat> three years, three complete years, without even having a, a furlough of any kind, and you've been in combat that long. So they put him on an empty freighter, and he said it was so light it was up on top of the waves, and I wish they'd had it loaded, but it bounced around. And I was seasick for 21 days. And then I got malaria. And he was six foot, one inch tall. When he got home, he was 110 pounds. Sacrifice. Now, and then he got home and he saw his four-year-old son he had not seen since he was born. Sacrifice. Now, I know that story. I've lived that story, lived with the man who told me that story. But do you realize that that story could be repeated literally tens of thousands of times across America. And to me, it illustrates this idea of sacrifice. Thank you, men and women, you veterans, for your sacrifice. Let me tell you briefly about the greatest sacrifice, though, of all. David sung of it a moment ago. You see, every war requires sacrifice from someone. Someone has to pay a huge price. And since the beginning of time, there's been a war going on that it's not being fought with bullets and bombs and airplanes and guns and artillery because it's a war in the spiritual realm. It's the war, the battle between good and between evil. And since our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned in the Garden of Eden and they, the fall came, sin entered into the world and every one of us have been tainted with it. And since that time, this battle has been raging. It's raging today. In fact, right now, the forces of evil, some would say, appear to be winning because there seems to be more evil that we see in the culture than there is good things that are happening around us. However, we know what the problem is, and there are many of us here today, we're doing everything we can to try to hold back that evil force that would dominate our lives and destroy not only our spiritual life, but also our political freedom. And you see, the basic problem is that every one of us have sinned. All you have to do, if you don't believe me on that, and I find that that's re really the basic problem, that when people accept the fact that they truly are sinners, then it's not hard to get them to receive the gospel of Christ. The problem is so many people think they really don't need salvation. They really don't need forgiveness, that they're not absolutely and totally dependent upon what Christ did for them for their salvation. They're trying to help him by some form of good works, or they just block out the idea that they're sinners at all. And all I have to do is measure myself by the Ten Commandments. Do you ever measure yourself by the Ten Commandments? It's really a healthy exercise. The Bible says in the first commandment, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Well, I haven't done that. I've broken the first commandment. I break it even now sometimes because I get preoccupied with other things and my affections and my mind tends to go in a different direction. And I don't give the Lord a thought for way too long. I don't put him first in every single area of my life and my heart. And therefore, I've missed the first commandment. And thou shalt not lie. Have I ever lied? No. And I just told you another one, didn't I? 
And have I ever stolen anything? Oh, yeah. And the value didn't make any difference, whether it was a postage stamp or I robbed a bank. The principle is the same. I took what did not belong to me. Have I ever looked at the opposite sex with the wrong thoughts? Yes, I have. I'm, I'm ashamed to admit, but yes, I have. And I could go on and on. Have I ever used the Lord's name in vain? Ashamedly, yes, I have. So here I am, Bill Monroe, Baptist preacher, and you can check off about two-thirds of them against me right now. And I'm not going to admit the rest of it. <laughs> so since I am a sinner, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means veterans need Jesus Christ too, by the way. Do you know I had a veteran tell me, I think when I stand before the Lord, I went through hell in the Korean War. And I think that that's going to count for me. I can tell him I've already been to hell. My friend, as much as I love and appreciate what you've done for your country, you are dead wrong on that one. Nobody gets a pass for anything they've done in this life. And so how do you get rid of your sins? You come to Jesus Christ, the sin bearer. Look, listen to what the Bible says. It says he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It said he was wounded for our transgressions on the cross. And he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement or punishment, punishment of our sins was upon him, and with his stripes we're healed. There was nobody else could pay the price for you. Buddha never died for anybody. Muhammad never died for anybody. None of the other leaders of the great religions of the world ever did anything for anybody. They were just teachers of a moral system. But Jesus Christ went to the cross, and Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. Being God in human form, he could take all of our sins and pay for all of our sins himself at one time, and he did so that day on the cross. And then resurrected from the grave to show that he had power over death, that he was in fact God, the only person who's ever been able to do that. As a veteran today, it might be that because of experiences you had in combat and whatever, that there's not been any peace in your life for a long time. And you, maybe your, your heart cry is, oh, I would give anything if I could just have peace with God. Oh, how I would like to be able to lay my head on my pillow at night and know that everything is all right and that when the big bell rings for me and I'm called into eternity, I'm gonna meet the Lord and he's gonna say, I welcome you home, not because you were a veteran, not because you were a Baptist, not because you were a good person, but because Jesus Christ paid for your sins and I welcome you home as my child. And so to have peace with God, it's real simple. I always remember it like this, four R's. Realize your need. Realize your true condition. Don't compare yourself with other people. Sure, you can find people that you're better than they, but compare yourself to Jesus Christ, our ultimate model and example. And compared to him, we failed, haven't we? And realize that you have a need. Secondly, recognize that Jesus Christ paid for your sins, that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, recognize that Jesus Christ, being God, could do what no one else could do, and that is he could pay for every person's sin himself. Realize your need. Recognize that Jesus paid for your sins. And then repent of your sin. Turn from them. Say, Lord, what I've been doing and how I've been thinking and acting is wrong. And Lord, today I come to you. Please, I want to give you my sin and ask you to forgive me of it, and I want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And that's the last thing. Realize your need. Recognize that Jesus has already died and paid for your sins. Repent of your sin, and then receive Christ as your Savior. Here's one of the greatest verses in the Bible. 
John 1 and 12. As many as received him, Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Every other week, I deposit my check in the bank. I deposit it in the bank because I trust them to take care of it. I trust them that when I need it, I can write a check or use my debit or credit card and the money will be there to back up the purchases that I make. I trust them. I don't worry about it. I don't stay awake at night obsessing about is my money going to be there or not. I trust the bank. And salvation, faith in Christ, when we say to believe in Christ, to have faith in Christ, meaning the same thing, what we mean is that we come to the Lord Jesus and we deposit our sins with him. And by faith, we trust him to clear the account and to forgive us of our sins and to make us righteous in his sight. Just as I trust Jesus with my soul, in the same way, or just as I trust my money to the bank, I trust the Lord Jesus Christ with my soul. I hope that you have done that. I preached that message over and over. I've been preaching it for 47 years from this pulpit here in Florence. It's still the greatest thing. When I preach this, I get all caught up in it. It touches my heart again that God would love me enough that he would die, that he would send his son to die for me. Boy, I hope that's not old stuff to you, but I hope that your heart is touched when you think about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for you today. I want you to bow your head with me in prayer. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. If tomorrow all things were gone, I'd work for all my life, and I'd have to start again with just my children.
Thank you so much. It's an honor and a privilege to welcome you on this great Memorial Day weekend. It's good to be in the great state of South Carolina. And it's good to be here. Yes, yes, some South Carolinians in the room. It's great to be here at Florence Baptist Temple. You know, it's funny, I, I, I told Laura I was taking her to Florence. And uh, she was practicing her Italian. <laughs> I wish she could be here with us today. I'm sorry she can't. But to those of you who have made the wise decision today to follow Jesus Christ from Laura and me, way to go, amigos. <laughs> That's right. That's right, ma'am. Jeb's not the only one that speaks Spanglish. Feliz Navidad. My llama is Jorge Bush. And one day, brothers and sisters, we will look into the eyes of our Savior when we see him face to face. And he'll look it back at us and say something like this. Well done. Mi casa is su casa. But to the devil and all his team, he might use a little Mexican food lingo and say, mi casa is nachos. <laughs> oh, that's right, folks. We're just going to have a good time here today. As a ma'am, ma don't be intimidated. I I I'm just like anybody else. I lost my job back in 2008. <laughs> About the same time I lost my house. <laughs> wow, two terms. It only felt like about eight years. <laughs> oh, I wish, my, I wish my lovely Laura could be here with you today to meet you. She's such a sweetheart. Lovely Laura, that's what I call her. <laughs> when I first met her, she was a librarian. <laughs> I'll never forget the first time I looked into those beautiful brown eyes and I said, now that's a book I gotta check out. And it's great to be with America's finest, her armed forces, the Army, Navy, Coast Guard, the Air Force, and the Marines. Yes. Where, where's Rally? Rally, where are you? Rally props. Sir, thank you so much. Number one, for Normandy, for North Africa, and for living so long. <laughs> there he is standing up. Let's, let's let him know we love him. Yeah. And to each and every one of you active duty service members, I cannot thank you enough for stepping up and making that decision. Life is full of decisions, one decision after another. And when you step across that line and you sign that form, you decide to put your life on the line for someone else. And that's a decision that many people don't understand. They couldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. But you did it. You're brave. And I'm proud of you. Thank you again. Thanks. Whether I'm visiting Walter Reed or one of the great uh, hospitals here in our country for our veterans, or whether I'm playing golf with some of America's finest combat wounded veterans or on my bike run that I do every year, whether I'm just visiting, whether I'm loving on someone, whether I'm in a nursing home, it always makes me feel so proud to live in a country that is so service-minded. And it reminds me of 9-11, when men and women of all uh, occupations just stepped out of their normal life and went down there into that hole and just started digging. Does my heart so proud, I tell you. I love it. The stories that I've had the privilege of hearing will warm your heart, and if you ever get a chance, to talk to the men and the women of our armed forces, those who serve and those who did serve, those who gave their time at 
Hurricane Sandy, Katrina, and other natural disasters, the stories of the miracles are just amazing. And it just makes you know that God is real and he's among us. It's very awesome. And there's no better way to give your time than to someone else. And as Donald Trump would say, that I can tell you. <laughs> Speaking of Donald Trump, what an event, eventful election cycle we just had. Oh my goodness gracious. I, I tried to get my brother Jeb elected. <laughs> I even went out with him on the campaign trail. <laughs> what a grueling 48 hours. first thing you learn about the campaign trail is that it's not an actual trail. I brought my bike for no reason at all. But as I say, I, I tried to get Jeb elected. He was a great leader, a great governor of Florida, and he's an honest fellow. I learned when we were kids that he will always tell you the truth. All you have to do is hold him down and tickle him long enough. And old Donald Trump, he was mean to old Jeb, you know? He called him low energy. That hurt Jeb's feelings. He had to go home and take a nap. <laughs> and now some folks are questioning President Trump's faith. Even Donald Trump, he invited me up to Camp David one time, uh, not long ago. And, and he said, when we got there, you know, and it's just he and I are alone in the room, and he said, Mr. President, I have a question for you. I know you're a great man of faith, and I am a Christian too, I think but I'm not sure, and how can I be sure? And I said, that's easy. We'll send you hunting with Dick Cheney. <laughs> I thought, I don't know if we'll see Donald pray, but I know we'll see Donald duck. <laughs> oh. People ask, ask if I, knew I was going to run for president when I was younger. <laughs> if I knew I was going to run for president, I'd have behaved better in college. <laughs> but there were inklings, you know, when I was a kid. For example, in grade school, when the teacher would take the role, everyone else would say, present, and I would say, POTUS. <laughs> you thought I was going to say president, didn't you? <laughs> and mom never understood me. She never understood why every Thanksgiving I would try to pardon the turkey. <laughs> and then there was one day when, when Jeb and I got in a tuffle, you know, and, and I was about to get spanked for something that Jeb did. And I looked at mom and I said, I appeal to the Supreme Court. <laughs> she just looked at me and said, I am the Supreme Court. <laughs> but I have to thank God for the two first ladies in my life, Barbara Bush, and my lovely Laura Bush. And if it weren't for them, I wouldn't be half the man I am. Well, come to think of it, if it weren't for my mom, I wouldn't be the other half either. <laughs> but you know, gentlemen, each one of us in this room, we have our own first ladies, our moms, our wives, and the women around us that give sacrificially to help us fulfill our dreams. And I'd like to take a moment, we've been thanking the troops and many of them are women, but let's just take a moment, guys, and let all the ladies in the room know how much we appreciate and love and support them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll never forget the first time I got to uh, fly into the green zone I've had the privilege of flying into Iraq and Afghanistan about eight times during my presidency. But the first time was awesome. It was Thanksgiving 2003, and no one could know about it or else the mission would have to be scrubbed. It was a moonless night, and we got into Air Force One about three in the morning. And we took off into a silent sky. When we got over there, the only instruction we gave them was all lights out. I mean, we had no running lights. We had no landing lights, no lights in the plane. 
We had to feel our way in. I won't say we hit anything when we landed, but Laura and I got brand new camel hair coats out of the deal. <laughs> we went over there to encourage the troops to eat a little turkey with the boys and to prove to the world that George W. Bush does not have arachnophobia. <laughs> Thought of that one up myself. <laughs> I was speaking of uh, animal clothing. I, I just got my new boots, but no ostriches were harmed in the making of my boots. I'm trying to show them to the camera here. There they are. The, the ostrich was harmed before the making of the boots. In, in, in a tragic hunting accident with Dick Cheney. <laughs> Speaking of aiming, there were 17 Republican candidates for president of the United States and Donald trumped them all. <laughs> Amazing. And I want you to know as president, I read my Bible every day. And when I was in office, I read my utmost for his highest and several other devotionals and the word of God every single day. And now I pray for our new president and I hope you do too. It's a biblical mandate to pray for our leaders. I love leadership. I love being around other leaders. I love the opportunity to study great American leaders, George Washington, Winston Churchill, Captain America. <laughs> Speaking of leadership, I, wanna, I just wanna ask you guys to, to say this with me. Courage. Courage. Communication. Communication. Character. Because I call those the four C's of leadership. <laughs> hey, you laugh, but it, it, it took a lot of courage to do what I did. Run the country, fight terrorists, be around Dick Cheney. <laughs> you know what they called this in Washington? The Cheney reaction. <laughs> One day someone put a sticker on my limo that said, duck, duck, goose, Cheney's loose. <laughs> But when you're a leader, and every parent here is a leader, you've got to lead by biblical values and principles. Even if no one else thinks your ideas are any good. <laughs> With the liberal media, that's something I had to get used to. But it's all right, ma'am, it made me tough. Now I've got thick skin like an elephant, which is the symbol of the Republican Party. <laughs> my Democratic friends here are depicted as a donkey or as my friends to the South call you, uh, burritos. <laughs> now, the second C, it's the first time I ever got a clap for a joke. <laughs> Communication, do not misunderestimate. Shame me once, fool on you. I've studied the studies. And the most important part of communication is talking. <laughs> That's right. You know, sometimes I do mess up my uh, vernacular, but I'll have you know that I am fluent in over nine different body languages. <laughs> Some of which I had to give up after I got saved, Pastor. <laughs> just, just saying. <laughs> Sneaks out once in a while when I'm in the car. <laughs> Oh. Now the third C, character, character. Character is a kind of a, it can be a hard word to pin the tail on the, uh, you know, the definition of that donkey. But character, I like to think is who you are when no one's looking. Ooh. But we all want to have the character of Christ and we want to be growing in that knowledge of Christ so that we can be transformulated into his image. As it says in the book of Ephesians, be imitators of God as beloved children, not just a couch potato, but an imitator. And I like that. It's, it's, it's good to be authentic too, because you know, I hate a phony. <laughs> Nothing worse. 
I've had the privilege of flying Air Force One. Oh, Air Force One. <laughs> what a man cave. <laughs> I've flown Air Force One all around the world. I've, I've, I've slept in Buckingham Palace. I've watched the sun rise over Jerusalem. And I've feasted in the deserts of Abu Dhabi. <laughs> I know, I like that word. <laughs> Abu Dhabi. <laughs> Sounds like bibbidi bobbidi. <laughs> So anyway, to, to, to capsize what I'm trying to say, we want to, with courage, communicate the gospel with a heart of character. And I've been asking myself, well, what is it that, that communicates real well? Well, Pastor Monroe, for one thing, is an awesome communicator, but if, if you don't have pastor's gift of communication. What could you do? Someone like me. Well, I, I figured it out. It's music. Music is the universal language. I dare say each and every one of us, we've got songs that are stuck in our hearts. Songs that we learned when we were younger, the old rugged cross. And then there are great American anthems like, like this. Help me out with this. Oh, say, can you see? see? I like the letter C because it's also a word. <laughs> I see you. A three-letter sentence that's so, so important that every hospital has a wing named after it. <laughs> Amazing. That's also the fourth C, by the way, from C to shining C. But even though I like the letter C, dub D is my favorite letter because it's the first letter in the word W. <laughs> so you're probably wondering, where is the president going with all this? Well, I've been taking guitar lessons from my friend Willie Nelson, who's legal in Colorado. And I actually brought my guitar. Would you guys like to hear a song? All right. Hey, guys. Hey, back there. It's good to see you. Y'all did a great job on that uh, uh, Anchors Away deal. <laughs> so you might think, well, wait a minute, Mr. President. I, I thought you were painting. Well, yeah, painting. Painting can be done with music, too. So you just have to be willing to think outside the box. You have to be willing to do what I, what I call, see this is two dimes, but if I toss it over there, it becomes a paradigm shift. <laughs> All right, here we go. Well, I'm the free world leader. Freedom is rolling out to you. Lovely 
lady stays on my mind Whoa, she's so fine Well, I'm a Laura lover Ooh, That lovely lady stays on my mind That was the president doing the king <laughs> Well, I'm so glad I got her love for my own now Child, there won't be no child left behind. Seems how lately, baby, got a bad case of red, white, and. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is John Morgan. It's an honor to be here as a George Bush impersonator and imitator of Jesus Christ. Blue. Thank you so much, Pastor. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we, I, I wanted to do something for the veterans, and I knew that the one man in America that veterans love more than anybody else was George Bush. And I tried and I tried and I tried and I couldn't get him. <laughs> so I got the next best thing, John Morgan. John, it's so good to have you today. You did a great job for us. Thank you. <laughs>